Comrade Korolev, the Americans are planning to launch a rocket to the moon. Moon? What is the moon? You mean Luna? Ah yes, that's right, Luna, that is the Russian word for the moon. We should do the same. I agree, let us go and plan a rocket. It is time for the Soviets to go to Luna. Welcome to What the Math. Hello YouTube and welcome to episode 8 of the History of Space Flight with Kerbal Space Program. In today's video we're going to be talking about the Luna missions, the Soviet missions to the moon. In episode 7 we were talking about the Pioneer missions which were actually quite similar to the Luna missions, except that their goal was to try to pass by the moon and to essentially uh, get as much readings and pictures as possible by using the Pioneer probes. Unfortunately the first uh, few probes failed and uh, the probe that succeeded passed by a little bit too far to take any photos but it was successful in reaching the heliocentric or heliocentric orbit uh, which means that they started orbiting the sun but it wasn't the first to do so as a matter of fact the first probe to do so was the Luna probe. Today we're going to be talking about this mission and let's start with the idea of why and where and who and what. So Luna 1 was actually a Soviet launch spacecraft and it managed a lot of firsts. Specifically it managed to achieve the first escape velocity, it was the first artificial comet because it actually accidentally released some gas uh, while on the way to the moon and this created a really beautiful tail that you could see from many locations around the world. And even though technically it actually kind of failed uh, to achieve its primary goal, it uh, succeeded in being the first uh, heliocentric artificial satellite. In other words, it was the first satellite to enter the orbit around the sun. And because this was actually a true race, in this case the US was trying to launch its own moon rocket and Soviet Union was trying to do the same and it really, really was like within the few months difference um, in uh, late 1958. But the Soviets were actually kind of leading the US because their rockets started to be launched earlier and they were getting closer and closer to success uh, and they were about to actually win this particular race. And the way it looked for both the American and the Soviets is that they were essentially just launching rockets over and over at the moon hoping that one of them will reach it but in this case no one was really winning except for of course gravity. All lunar missions were actually launched on top of um, this particular rocket called Vostok L um, but earlier on it was just known as the lunar rocket and it was a derivative of our seven rocket that also launched um, Sputnik satellites and the first three failed and unfortunately they failed because of the structural integrity uh, there was a little bit too much vibration and uh, Korolev's team could not figure out why it was vibrating so much and then finally Luna uh, 4 or as it was later known as Luna 1 because it was really the successful one ended up finally getting into space and uh, passing by the moon. But Soviets did not see Luna 1 as a, as a success because it was actually not meant to pass by the moon, it was meant to collide with it which is what we're going to be doing today. Luna 1 and later on Luna 2 were actually the first they were meant to be lunar impactors and what this means is that they were actually meant to smack into the moon and deliver a tiny tiny payload by essentially just crashing into the moon and that payload was of course Soviet coat of arms and uh, kind of a little flag of Soviet Union made of metal that was essentially just uh, a sign of success and a sign of Soviet Union reaching the moon. Now the actual probe was relatively he heavy it was uh, 361 kilograms or almost a thousand or over a thousand pounds in weight and uh, it consisted of a, of a sphere uh, similar to Sputnik in a sense, it was pressurized on the inside and it had five antennas that extended from the one of the hemispheres. This probe or actually all of the lunar probes were battery powered and the battery was just enough to uh, to last until uh, the collision with the moon and it also contained radio equipment and tracking and transmissions. Uh, there's some telemet telemetry in there to um, keep track of um, everything that's going on with the mission and there were actually a lot of uh, specifically five different scientific devices for studying interplanetary space. It had a magnetometer, there's a 
Geiger counter. Uh, there's something called scintillation counter uh, to measure different waves and also micrometeorite detector as well. So this was actually quite a complex scientific mission. And during this flight, uh, this mission also released one kilogram of sodium for tracking purposes so that it was easier to track this probe. And this actually created uh, um, the first artificial comet in space. So this was actually so uh, beautifully visible from space or from Earth that is that many people actually uh, took photos and uh, you could actually see this beautiful comet as it approached the moon. Now the first three missions were actually unfortunately unsuccessful. They, um, because of the vibration, they actually got destroyed in the um, lower or, or upper atmosphere. Uh, but the fourth mission was successfully launched on 2nd of January 1959. Now, there was still a malfunction, unfortunately, and this was uh, because of the ground-based control system that caused an error in um, how long the rocket would burn um, the, uh, the final stage. And uh, it burned for too long, so it actually overshot and overflew the moon at a distance of about 6,000 kilometers or about um, 3-4,000 miles. And um, because of this, they had to rename this from Luna to Mechta, which means hope or dream. And so even though it was known as Luna 1, it, would it was also known in Soviet Union as Mechta because it never really crashed into the moon. But nevertheless, it was able to actually uh, beat uh, Pioneer 4 mission, which we, we talked about in the previous video, by about a month, uh, specifically one month and two days. It was a little bit earlier uh, to pass by the moon. But Pioneer was considered to be a success because it actually did um, achieve its heliocentric orbit and only really missed the moon by about uh, 30,000 kilometers. And later in that year, on September uh, 12th of 1959, Luna 2 actually was able to uh, have an impact with the moon and it was a very similar probe to the one uh, that we had in, in Luna 1 as well. But it wasn't until Luna 3 that the first uh, photographs were uh, of the far side of the moon were actually taken and we might talk about this in one of the future videos because this mission was actually a lot more complex than Luna 1 and Luna 2 missions. Now, as I mentioned before, all of these rockets were based on the um, Korolev design of R7 um, ICBM rocket, which was meant to be uh, to deliver uh, basically nuclear weapon payloads to to United States. Uh, but um, this was later renamed into Vostok uh, rocket, and even today, the uh, derivative of this rocket is used to launch um, all of the astronauts, all every single astronaut is actually, uh, specifically the astronauts on the International Space um, Station, are actually all launched with a similar design. So this is this is a design that's, that's been uh, proven by time to be extremely successful and specifically because of uh, this sort of uh, uh, two-stage or sometimes three-stage uh, launch. So here we have uh, essentially, it's it's a main stage with four boosters on the side, and then when you separate the boosters, it creates this beautiful uh, cross, which is now known as a Korolev's cross because of the name of the designer, uh, Sergei Korolev. And this rocket, um, even today, is extremely robust, extremely successful, and there are very, very, very few failures in comparison to other rocket uh, designs around the world. Now, despite Luna 1's failure, today it's actually seen as one of the more successful first Luna missions, or not Luna, Luna missions, or moon missions. And uh, even though it didn't really achieve its intended mission, it managed to achieve a lot more. Surprisingly, its failure actually created an opportunity for a lot of more exploration. And it, today, it still is somewhere out there orbiting between Mars and Earth. We don't really know where exactly it is, but it's definitely somewhere out there. And when it launched, uh, America was still struggling to put Pioneer 1 into orbit. Uh, it was actually around the same time when Pioneer 1 reached the altitude of 71,000 miles and then fell back to Earth. So America was really falling behind in this uh, moon race. And the cool thing about this particular mission is that not only did it achieve the escape velocity needed, but it was also the first craft to actually detect the solar winds, specifically the charged particles that the sun emits that cause a lot of trouble on our planet. Also, when it emitted the sodium gas uh, into space, it allowed scientists to test how gas acts in space, what happens to actual gas when it's released in space. And obviously this allowed us to study a lot of really awesome um, zero gravity effects of gas and various particles. But of course, on September 14th, 1959, 
this is when the Soviets were rejoicing because Luna 2 actually did succeed in everything that it was set out to do, specifically uh, smacking into the moon. Uh, it impacted the moon east of uh, an area called Mare Ibrium, uh, near a crater called Archimedes, after the Greek mathematician. And um, it was launched successfully and it basically crashed on the moon, delivering everything it, it was meant to deliver. Interesting thing about the bo both of these missions is that they took a direct path to the moon. They didn't really uh, circularize uh, around Earth. They basically just blasted their engines full speed ahead and uh, they aimed toward the moon and one of them hit it. And unlike in Kerbal Space Program, uh, for, for this mission to be successful at basically reaching the moon and smacking onto it, uh, the launch actually had to occur from the opposite side of, um, of Earth. So in other words, when it was launched, um, uh, the side of the Earth was opposite the moon, so you couldn't even see the moon in the sky. And since neither Luna 1 nor Luna 2 had any kind of propulsion system on board, uh, they were basically kind of uh, meant to just uh, fly in space without really uh, anything. Uh, they were Once you launched them, they, they had no uh, no ability to control themselves. They, just, they kind of just reported uh, their findings, their scientific findings, their telemetry data back to Earth until they disappeared into outer space or until they smacked in, on the surface of the moon. But of course, for the Soviets, the other important part was the two little pennants, Soviet pennants that were located inside, inside the spacecraft. These were actually sphere-shaped uh, with the surface covered in, in uh, little pentagons and inside of them was actually an, a little explosive that would uh, shatter the sphere, sending all of these little pentagon shields in all directions. And interestingly, each of these little pentagons was basically stainless steel and had a Soviet coat of arms, a little bit of uh, writing on them. I think it also said USSR on most of them. And basically, this was kind of like a little propaganda sphere that would send all of these little shields across the surface of the moon. It also, of course, had the date written on it. I believe it just said January 1959 on Luna 1 and September 1959 on Luna 2. But whether they actually succeeded in delivering those little pennants to the surface or, as most people think, vaporized on impact because it was going ridiculously fast and probably exploded and just bounced off back into the um, outer solar system, is not really known. We'll probably never even find them because they're so, so tiny. Now, the copy of this sphere was presented to um, President, American President uh, Dwight Eisenhower by Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet Premier, and essentially this was meant for a kind of a, a peace offering and a friendly, uh, friendly sign from uh, Khrushchev to Eisenhower just to show that, yes, it's a friendly space race and so far we are winning. You can actually still find this particular sphere in um, Eisenhower Presiden Presidential Library and Museum in um, Abilene, Kansas, and you can kind of look at it and read the engravings on top, of, on the surface of it. But there's actually another copy of the sphere that's located in Kansas Cosmosphere in Hutchison, Kansas. So you can also, if you go there, you can also find one there as well. And here's actually a picture of it, so you can kind of take a look at it, and it will look exactly the same. So these little pentagons you see on the surface would basically spread into various directions upon explosion and impact. Now, all in all, this was actually a surprisingly interesting mission. Um, unlike the Pioneer mission, not only did it succeed in um, reaching a heliocentric orbit, but it also created some really cool scientific uh, observations, including uh, being the first uh, artificial comet, and of course passing by within something like 6,000 kilometers of the moon surface, which was a lot closer than the Pioneer 4. And so at this point, in the middle to late 1959, Despite 19 uh, rocket launches from the US and only four launches from the, the United, uh, from the Soviet Union, um, the Soviet Union was actually leading in space race. Their rockets were a lot more efficient, they were a, a lot more successful, and some of the scientific findings from the Soviets were actually a little bit more interesting than the findings from the Americans. And interestingly, the Soviets only used R-7 derivative rockets, while Americans had Vanguard, Thor, Juno-2, and Atlas rockets, and all four of those were only marginally successful so far. 
But nevertheless, we're going to talk about all of these other really awesome missions in future videos. And that is it for Luna 1 and Luna 2 missions. Thank you guys so much for watching and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Check out some of the other videos about history of space program and other Kerbal Space Program videos that I posted right here. If you enjoyed this video, like it and share it with your friends, family, your teachers, or anyone else who you think might like space and space videos. In the next video, we're going to be talking about another really awesome mission, but I'm not going to spoil what it is yet. Thank you guys, and game you later. Bye-bye.